Hi guys, uh, welcome to the fourth part of the genetics unit done by Gampaha Medical Students Association. Uh, like we have said in our past videos, we are doing this to help A-level students, especially those doing A-levels in 2020, to help cover up missed units that they haven't done in school or in their tuition classes as of yet. Uh, my name is Melaka, and in today's video we'll be speaking about six major topics. Human sex determination, sex-linked characteristics, X-linked genes and characteristics, pleiotropy, epigenetics, and finally, population genetics. So, starting off with human sex determination. By now, you should know that humans have 46 chromosomes, which are paired into 23 pairs. Out of those 23 pairs, there are 22 autosomal chromosomes, which are completely homologous to each other. However, there is a single pair of chromosomes, which is called the sex pair of chromosomes in humans. Now, there are two types of sex chromosomes in humans. They are called the X chromosome and the Y chromosome. Uh, the X chromosome is inherently bigger than the Y chromosome and also codes for much more genes than the Y chromosome. Therefore, the X chromosome and the Y chromosome are only homologous to each other in certain parts. And when they do pair up, they remain homologous to each other only in small parts. However, when an X chromosome and an X chromosome pair up with each other, uh, they are completely homologous. Now, in humans, sex is determined by the combination of uh, X and Y chromosomes. So, uh, in males, males have X and Y chromosomes both. So, one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. Whereas in females, females have two X chromosomes. So, in this way, uh, you, the genotype of a fetus determines its uh, gender. Now, uh, in males, when the formation of gametes occur, uh, due to the presence of both the X and Y chromosomes, there is a 50% chance of a gamete getting the X chromosome, and there is a 50% chance of the gamete getting the Y chromosome. However, in females, there is a 100% chance of the gamete getting the X chromosome. Why? Because there is only the X chromosome present and the Y chromosome uh, isn't present. So, therefore, when uh, deciding uh, when a male and a female individual mate and produce offspring, there is a 50% chance of the offspring being male and there is a 50% chance of the offspring being female. Right, so in this monohybrid cross, uh, you can see how first gametes are formed and then how uh, offspring is formed uh, in humans during human sex determination, right? So, what you have to first notice is the probability uh, of uh, gametogenesis in the males and females, right? Now, as you can see, in males, they have an X and a Y chromosome, which will, which will result in 50% uh, of sperm having the X chromosome and 50% of uh, the sper uh, sperm having the Y chromosome. In females, however, because they have only one uh, type of X, uh, sex chromosome, uh, they have two X chromosomes, this will result in the egg always having a 100% chance that it contains uh, an X chromosome. So, after that, what you should uh, take your attention to next is the cross itself, right? So, in, in this way, you can see how uh, the uh, alleles in the gametes combine to form the genotypes of the offspring. In this case, uh, two X chromosomes uh, combine to make a female offspring. This is wrong. This should be female. And uh, in this case, uh, an X and a Y chromosome combine to form a male offspring. Again, this is also wrong uh, in the given note. So, 
what you should understand is the percentage uh, probability of the formation of the male and female offspring. Right now, if you can remember the multiplication rule you learned in the second video, uh, you can apply the same thing here. So, we'll take one example of the male offspring. If there is a 50% chance of uh, the sperm containing the Y chromosome, and there's a 100% chance of the sperm containing the X chromosome, then the multiplication rule would say that because the, the gametogenesis of the male and female parents are two separate individual and non-related events, that you can inherently multiply the probability of the formation of the sperm and the formation of the egg. So in this case, it's 50% into 100%, which will which equals to 50%. And this is how you get the probability of the formation of the male offspring. And uh, this can be said in the same way uh, for the female offspring as well. So sex chromosomes in humans do not only contain genes that uh, express sexual characteristics, right? They also contain genes that express uh, other characteristics within the individual. Uh, such genes and characteristics are, low, are called sex-linked genes and sex-linked characteristics as well. And these are further divided into two depending on which type of sex chromosome they are found in. Uh, genes and characters located uniquely on the X chromosome are called X-linked genes and X-linked characters. And genes and characters that are located uniquely on the Y chromosome are called Y-linked genes and Y-linked characters. So because of this, in some cases, uh, there are disorders which are produced by mutated forms of genes which are located only on the X chromosome or uh, which are located only on the Y chromosome. Therefore, these disorders uh, unproportionately affect either one of the genders. So they can either affect males much more than females or they can affect females much more than males. And this is decided whether on uh, by whether uh, these characters are Y-linked or X-linked. Uh, so two examples for diseases such as these are red-green color blindness, which is a X-linked recessive disorder characterized by the difficulty in perceiving red and green colors, and also hemophilia, which is a blood clotting disorder where the proteins required for blood clotting aren't present. And therefore, a hemophilic person risks severe bleeding due to the delay in the clotting process. So, when it comes to X-linked genes, this is very important, especially in the male species. Uh, this is because males have only one X chromosome and uh, one y, y chromosome, whereas females have, again, two X chromosomes. So, to normally express the recessive character of a gene, uh, the genotype of a particular organism should be recessive homozygous, right? If the genotype is heterozygous or dominant homozygous, then the recessive character of that gene wouldn't be expressed. However, in males, because there is only one X, uh, sex chromosome, the presence of a single recessive allele is sufficient to express the recessive uh, character of that specific gene. Why? Because there is no corresponding allele or gene on the Y chromosome to match the uh, allele on the X chromosome or overpower it. Uh, so therefore, disorders such as uh, red-green color blindness and hemophilia will be expressed in males with the presence of a single uh, recessive allele on the X chromosome and therefore disproportionately affect males over females who have a corresponding allele usually to make it heterozygous or who usually are uh, dominant homozygous individuals. So here is a monohybrid cross which shows the inheritance of 
uh, x link characters now in this case i have written i have shown the sex chromosomes as well uh, and i have also shown the dominant allele as capital a and the recessive allele as uh, simple a so in this case uh, this parent would inherently be male because of the presence of the X and Y chromosomes and this parent would be female. Uh, the male parent in this case has a dominant allele on its X chromosome whereas in the female's case one X chromosome has a dominant allele and one X chromosome has a, a recessive allele. So uh, during gametogenesis uh, the usual way of formation of uh, the gametes will occur whereas the male will have a 50% chance of containing the X chromosome 50% chance of containing the Y chromosome and in females in this case because there is a difference between the X chromosomes I have shown it in uh, as two gametes uh, there will be one X chromosome with the dominant uh, there is there will be 50% chance of there being an X chromosome with a dominant A allele and a 50% chance of the X chromosome having the recessive A allele. So therefore, when uh, you do the cross, you will understand that there are four main genotypes that can occur uh, with regards to X-linked characters and they are in X-linked disorders. So in this case, I have described this gene as uh, the recessive allele produces a disorder which means that if you are homologous recessive uh, or you have only one recessive allele you will show the disorder so in this case uh, first of all you have to notice that again there is a 50% chance of there being females and 50% chance of there being males however the next thing you have to notice is that in females there are two genotypes that can occur. Uh, the first genotype is where both X chromosomes have a dominant allele which can be called a normal female. The second genotype is where one X chromosome has a dominant A allele and the other X chromosome has a recessive A allele. Now these are called, this genotype is called a carrier female. Why? I'll explain uh, in a little while. Uh, when it comes to males, there are again two types of genotypes. The first genotype is where the X chromosome has a, a dominant A allele, which is a normal male. And the second genotype is where the X chromosome has a recessive allele, which as you know, uh, because there is no dominant A allele, uh, a capital A allele on uh, the Y chromosome to overpower the effect of the recessive A allele, uh, the disease will be shown in the male. Now, coming back to carrier females, uh, this genotype is called as a carrier because of the fact that it holds a recessive allele and therefore can inherently act as a carrier for the disease and can transfer that disease into future generations. Uh, if you look at the female parent she is also a carrier and because of this has transferred uh, there is a possibility of her transferring the disease to one of her offspring as shown by this uh, diseased male so pleiotropy is when a single gene uh, affects multiple unrelated traits in a, a certain individual right so Usually these traits are traits related to uh, certain hereditary diseases in humans. And two examples for this is uh, sickle cell disease and cystic fibrosis. So sickle cell disease is a disease caused by the alteration of the hemoglobin protein in red blood cells. In individuals who have the homozygous recessive genotype for this specific gene, the shape the uh, properties of the hemoglobin protein are changed and they are of the sickle cell what we call the sickle cell variety in uh, environments with a low oxygen content there is automatically a low oxygen content in the blood of uh, an individual right 
So because of this, uh, sickle cell uh, hemoglobins can accumulate in red blood cells and change the shape of the red blood cell uh, to a sickle cell shape. These sickle cell red blood cells will then move to clog small arteries and small blood vessels which can cause uh, tissue and organ damage. This will therefore result in renal failure, heart failure and thrombosis. Cystic fibrosis is a disease which causes stick, uh, stickier and thicker mucus than uh, what is normally present. So this mucus will be then accumulated in the pancreas, lungs, digestive tract, reproductive tract and cause uh, lung infections, respiratory failure, uh, poor digestion and also infertility. Uh, the mucus is thickened because of the excess chlorine secretion of defected chloride channels of the plasma membrane. This defect in the transmembrane chloride channel occurs as a result of the mutated cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator protein which is caused by the mutation of the CTFTR gene and this as well is autosomal recessive disorder which means you have to be homozygous recessive for you to have that particular disorder. So epigenetics is the study of the occurrence of certain phenotypes of certain characters controlled by factors other than their DNA sequence. So in some cases uh, the DNA sequence doesn't necessarily control uh, what characteristics are expressed by certain genes. Instead uh, they are controlled by something which is uh, colloquially called switching on and switching off. Now switching on and switching off is a result of uh, two processes called methylation and demethylation. Uh, methylation is where a methyl group is added to a DNA sequence and demethylation is the process where a methyl group is removed from an already uh, methyled uh, DNA sequence. Now the signals to uh, do these two processes can be of two varieties, right? They can either be inherited signals from parents or signals arising due to environmental factors. Now, because uh, there are two reverse processes, uh, signals given by either the parents or the environment can be reversed in uh, most cases. And therefore, by uh, these two processes happening, there can be a varied expression for the same uh, DNA sequence. For example, uh, schizophrenia is a mental disorder that occurs due to genetic defects, right? So in identical twins, which have the same genetic code and the same uh, DNA sequence, on, there are cases where only one twin gets schizophrenia and the other twin doesn't. So this clearly shows that the same DNA sequence can express its characters in uh, different and uh, varied ways, which is a result of the demethylation and methylation process, which is called uh, epigenetic inheritance. So when it comes to our final unit, uh, population genetics, there is a single very important principle that you have to know and understand, which is called the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Uh, now the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is used to assess whether a population is evolving or not evolving with regards to a specific gene or with regards to a specific uh, loci. Uh, so, what the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium does is it uses uh, predicted data and actual data to assess whether there is a change in this data uh, to therefore determine whether a population is evolving re with regards to a certain genetic uh, loci or not. And if there is a change in the predicted data and the actual data, 
then you could say that the population is evolving. However, if there is no change, then the population isn't evolving. Now, the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium principle was first put forward by two British mathematicians called J.H. Hardy and W. Weinberg in 1908. Uh, they used something which is called allele and genotype frequencies. Now, allele frequencies is basically the number of specific alleles for that gene uh, divided by the total number of alleles for that gene. For example, uh, the, the number of alleles which give a red color uh, in uh, flowers over divided by the total number of genes for uh, the total number of alleles for that specific gene will be known as the allele frequency of that allele that codes for the red color of the flowers and this is uh, the same with genotype so uh, J.H. Hardy and W. Weinberg they showed that the allele and genotype frequencies of a population will remain constant from generation to generation if that population is not evolving and this principle is now called the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium principle. To determine whether the allele and genotype frequencies have changed in consecutive generations, a Punnett square can be drawn and uh, the combination of alleles in all the possible crosses in a population uh, can be considered. So in this example for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, they have taken the example of the color of a flower in a plant. Uh, in the data set, they have taken uh, CR allele and CW allele. So in this case, CR allele, uh, being homozygous for CR allele will produce uh, red flowers because CR allele codes for the red pigment. Uh, CW allele codes for the white pigment and therefore being CW allele homozygous will produce white flowers and due to incomplete dominance as you learned in the third video uh, a heterozygous genotype of CR and CW will produce pink flowers. Now in this data set there are 500 flowers and due to the presence of two alleles in each flower there are a total of 1000 alleles and they have found that out of these 1000 alleles there are 800 CR alleles and 200 CW alleles. So therefore, now remember where I told you that uh, the allele frequency is the number of specific uh, is the number of that specific allele over the total number of alleles present in the population. And in this case, uh, to find the allele frequency of CR alleles, they have divided 800 by 1000 and gotten 0.8 and uh, they have in the case of CW alleles they have divided 200 by 1000 and gotten 0 0.2 now one special thing you have to notice here is that for the allele frequency of CR allele they have given a special letter called uh, P and the allele frequency of CW alleles they have given a special letter which is Q uh, and while this may not seem much to you right now, uh, you will see later why this is important. Also, you have to realize that these two allele frequencies when added up will uh, sum to 1. And therefore, you can get the equation of P plus Q equals 1 because we have already defined what P is and what Q is. So, using these allele frequencies, you can understand that the probability of an egg or sperm can, uh, that the, it contains either the CR allele or the CW allele can be determined using these allele frequencies. So, in this example, the probability of each gamete, whether it be egg or sperm, whether it contains a CR allele, uh, is 0.8. And the probability that each gamete contains a CW allele is uh, 0.2. Right. 
so to further understand uh, this concept better, uh, you can draw a Punnett square, as you have learned uh, in the previous lessons. So one side will be sperm, and one side will be eggs, and each side has been divided according to the probability that that gamete has of containing the CR allele or the CW allele. So in the in both the eggs and the sperm case. It's uh, eighty percent or zero point eight for the CR allele and twenty percent or zero point two for the uh, CW allele. And when you draw the Punnett square, uh, what you can realize is it's the same multiplication rule we learned in the second uh, video that applies here as well, right? So, formation of gametes in two parents are independent and non-related events. So therefore, the probabilities of each uh, of the formation of each gametes can be multiplied to find the probability of the uh, formation of the final genotype. So again in this case, it's 80% into 80% which will give 64% for the CR allele homozygous and CW allele it's 20% into 20% which will give 4% and in the case of the heterozygous nature uh, there are two heterozygous natures it can be either uh, CR CW or CW CR so uh, for one it's 20% into 80% which will give uh, 16% and because both are inherently heterozygous in nature the phenotype is the same in this case you can add both 16% to give a total of 32% uh, for the probability that the genotype is heterozygous and this can be uh, clearly seen here so all the percentages added will add up to 100%. So 64% plus 16% uh, plus 16% plus 4% uh, will add up to 100%. Now, remember where we assign letters for the allele frequency of CR allele and the allele frequency of CW allele. Uh, in this case, because we multiplied the allele frequencies to get the uh, genotype frequencies we can multiply those letters as well so for the CR homozygous it will be P squared for uh, CW homozygous it will be Q squared and for the heterozygous nature for each heterozygous nature it will be PQ so if you add both it can be called uh, 2PQ so PQ plus PQ equals to PQ. So as you can see here, uh, the terms that we used in the previous uh, examples have been defined. So P squared is the frequency of homozygous dominant, uh, Q squared is the frequency of recessive homozygous, and 2 PQ is the frequency of heterozygous uh, genotype. So they have used the values from the previous example here as well. Uh, P into P is Q squared. And therefore multiplying the allele frequencies you get 0.64 or 0, or 64%. The same can be done with Q squared where you multiply the allele frequencies giving 0.04 or 4%. And in hetero zygous uh, genotypes you can first multiply the allele frequency for one heterozygous genotype which will give 16% and then finally add it to give a total of 32% now as I stated before all these percentages and all these allele frequencies will either add up to 1 or 1000 therefore the final equation to for uh, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium can be written as P squared plus 
q squared plus 2pq equals 1. You can see p squared is 0 0.64, q squared is 0 0.04, 2pq is uh, 0 0.32, and 0 0.64 plus 0 0.04 plus 0 0.32 will give you a final sum of 1. And uh, this is called the equation for the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium describes a hypothetical population which, is, which isn't evolving, right? And for the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium to be proved, there are certain conditions that have to be filled. In most basic form, there are five major conditions. The first condition is the absence of mutations. Uh, genes cannot go undergo mutations. Why? Because this will inherently introduce new allele types to the population and therefore disturb the allele and uh, genotype frequencies in the population which will result in a modified gene pool. The second condition is the occurrence of random mating. Uh, if breeding occurs uh, randomly without any influence then selectiveness doesn't occur uh, the mating of specially close related individuals also may alter allele frequencies now this is uh, important because uh, if you mate certain genotypes together uh, their genotype frequencies will increase all others and therefore change the total uh, distribution of genotype frequencies in the population. The third condition is the absence of natural selection. Now this is because uh, if natural selection does occur, alleles or genotypes which aren't that favor favorable to the environment will slowly decrease and may uh, one day disappear. Uh, if natural selection doesn't occur, these allele types and genotypes will continue, uh, continuously persist within the population and therefore the uh, allele frequencies of all the alleles and uh, genotype frequencies of all the genotypes within the uh, population will remain constant. Uh, the fourth condition is that the population or uh, the size of the population should be extremely large for example if you had a hundred individuals which is a relatively small population and only uh, four individuals express a certain genotype there still would be a genotype frequency of uh, four percent or zero point uh, zero or zero point uh, zero 0.04 uh, within that population. However, since there are only four individuals who express that genotype, if those four individuals uh, by uh, some unfortunate incident uh, happen to die, then that genotype will inherently be removed from the population. And therefore, if you have an extremely large population, the death of uh, four individuals or ten individuals won't really affect the allele frequencies and the genotype frequencies uh, of the population. The fifth uh, condition is that there should be no immigration or immigration because if this happens then individuals who bear different allele types or genotypes can enter into the population and Therefore, this will disturb the uh, previously present allele frequencies and uh, gene genotype frequencies in the population. Same uh, goes if individuals leave the population because then uh, in uh, mem because then individuals who have a specific genotype or uh, an allele combination will be removed. And that genotype and the allele combination will also be removed from the population. So therefore, these five conditions have to be met in order to preserve the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. 
so by now you should understand that for evolution to occur within a certain population the genotype frequencies and the allele frequencies of that population should uh, continuously change right and evolution and thus uh, a population will be brought to a higher adaptive level or a higher suitability to their ecological niche uh, genetic this uh, change in the allele frequencies and genotype frequencies mainly occurs due to firstly mutation which introduces new alleles into a population and migration which will also include new alleles into a population to increase variation after those two processes happen natural selection will occur uh, will occur to choose the better adapted individuals for that ecological niche uh, depending on the phenotypes that they express and uh, they will uh, natural selection will allow these individuals to survive uh, or live or be stronger and fitter than the rest and therefore be able to survive their ecological niche and pass on their genes to the next generation which will cause the allele frequencies and the genotype frequencies of a population to change this will result in evolution and again uh, this will result in a higher adaptive level of that particular population to its current ecological niche a very recent example relatively recent example uh, can be taken with regards to the uh, peppered moth uh, in england so by the time of the industrialization which occurred in the 16th to 18th centuries uh, the moth had two phenotypic varieties based on their color uh, it had a dark color and a light color so prior to the industrialization of england the light colored allele was most was more prevalent which means that the moths were usually a uh, light colored and uh, the number of dark colored moths was much lower so this uh, helped the moth to hide on uh, white bark trees to avoid predation from birds and thus be able to uh, survive their uh, ecological niche and pass on their generations pass on their genes to future generations however when industrialization occurred due to the various pollutants and the soot that was released into the environment the light colored trees were stained dark uh, because of this the white moths who tried to hide on these trees could be clearly seen against the dark background and uh, therefore the numbers of uh, light colored moths were gradually uh, decreased however the dark colored moths were now able to hide on the dark background and therefore escape predation uh, from birds and survive better to their now changed ecological niche and pass on their uh, genes to the future generation so as a result of that the allele frequencies and the genotype frequencies of uh, that specific population have changed uh, to favor the dark alleles and what you see now is that there is more uh, dark colored moths than light colored moths uh, of that particular population in England and this proves that the population has evolved to a higher adaptive state with this change in genotypic frequencies and allele frequencies uh, so with that we come to the end of our video uh, part 4 of genetics and uh, also the end of the genetics uh, lesson as presented by the Gamba Medical Students Association. Uh, we hope that you have learned something from these videos and uh, please feel free to comment on any uh, weaknesses or things that we can correct on our end. Uh, thank you and uh, hopefully you watch the next videos that are posted as well.